So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this Zatz lecture under the title of Documenting the Egyptian Antiquities. And I would like to thank the, the Center for the Studies of the Antique uh, World um, for inviting um, um, us to give this talk and particularly for allowing Dr. Hisham Elaiti to um, present his work over the, f the last few years. Um, it's a great privilege, it's a, an honor to have you here. We know each other for many years, um, but uh, the honor comes with your uh, background. You, um, uh, Dr. Elaiti um, actually is a, has his uh, master thesis in archaeology done in 2001 on ancient Egyptian letters to the dead. In 2012 he got his PhD in archaeology in a uh, funeral painted wooden stella from Thebes. He has involved in many archaeological fieldwork. I can't read all the, the fieldwork here, it's uh, too long the list, but various uh, Egyptian missions, French mission, uh, Brazilian mission, Spanish mission, German mission. And uh, he's also, and this is a very important member of the permanent committee of the Supreme Council of Antiquities of Egypt since 2015. He was the general director of the scientific publication department. Uh, from 2011 till 2015, and the general director for the Center of Studies of Documentation of Egyptian Antiquities 2015 and 2018, all under the umbrella of Supreme Council of Antiquities, which is the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. And now, since um, four years, he's actually the Under Secretary of State for Documentation of Egyptian Antiquities, and we already talked before that uh, this documentation is the most crucial thing. You know, you can't do proper sign if science if things are not well documented, so we are really looking forward and it's a great pleasure and honor to have you here. Thank Please, you. Hisham. Uh, really, thank you so much, Frank, for this introduction. First of all, I would like to thank all of you to come to uh, listen and to see something different than you used to. And uh, also I'd like to thank uh, Frank for the kind of invitation to be here with you to, today. Uh, and also to thank my colleague and my friend uh, Mahmoud Ibrahim who organized this uh, event or everything behind this to be, to be possible to come uh, to Zurich. And uh, really I, I appreciate what uh, Frank and Mahmoud did the last few days in order to have this uh, invitation happening and everything. Um, as head of center of documentation, nobody uh, know what does it mean the Center of Studies and the Documentation of Egyptian Antiquities. And why it was, why it was established? When? Where? What the main components of the Center of Documentation? What is the achievements or challenges uh, we face? What are the priorities of the Center of Documentation? What are the steps the Center of Documentation does to protect and the cultural uh, properties. Why? The Center of Documentation was established in uh, 1956, and it was the purpose to document all the antiquities supposed to be sub covered with the water because of the floods and because the, the, the country wants to build a new dam, uh, the high dam, which is we already had our first uh, dam. It was Aswan 1920, and it was not enough to prevent the floods to cover because the flood, when we had flood in, in, uh, in 50s and 60s of the last century, really it was a disaster for the country covers and they destroy all the fields and destroy houses and the, all the monuments behind the, the, this dam, it was covered completely. And we have to find the solution how we can prevent or to save these uh, uh, monuments. And the, as I said, the high dam was established in January 1961 and it took uh, 10 years in order to be functioning. When the Center of Documentation, I just mentioned, it was 1956, officially, to 25 of April, 1990, uh, 1956, but one year before, it was the preparation in order to have this center function only to, to as I said, to document 
all the, mummy, uh, the monuments supposed to be sunk in under the water because of the high dam. First, when it was established, it was in the, uh, what's called Ramses Street. It was behind the Egyptian Museum in, in Cairo. If any of you visited Cairo, he can uh, imagine I visited the, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It's supposed to be behind the Egyptian Museum, but now it's demolished because in, in the 60s when they wanted to establish or to create and they erected the 6th of October bridge, they have to demolish all the uh, buildings behind the Egyptian Museum in order to have it. And this is, it was supposed to be by night, it was eliminated. But the new building now within Zamalek, Frank used to come, and Mahmoud, of course, and uh, it, before we were uh, Minister of Tourism, uh, Antiquities only, and then became Minister of uh, Tourism and Antiquities in 2018. The aim, Dr. Sarwat Hokashad was a former uh, Minister of Culture in the 50s, uh, during the re establishment of the uh, center of documentation. And he was the, the, the key person to um, salvage all the monuments, uh, uh, the Nubian monuments. And why he decided to go and to uh, try to save these monuments before uh, building the high dam. He wants, and you can see the date here, These important dates telling us how the international campaign to salvage the Nubian temples was established. Sarat Hokasha was in his office and he received the, ambassador, the American ambassador and the head of the Metropolitan Museum in 1958. The reason to receive those two people is because the, the head or the director of the Metropolitan that day wants to buy one of the temples supposed to be uh, sunken under the water because of the erecting of the high dam. Dr. Sarat Okasha really was, he thought, it's very, it is, he, 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 he felt shame that once a person wants come to sell or to buy one of uh, the heritage, one of our monuments, and he, he said, our monuments are not for sale, and he decided to go down to see all these monuments before doing anything. He went for two weeks to, down to uh, Aswan and then to Nubian, uh, to Nubia in order to see all the, the temples there. And he, he went with the late uh, Professor Ahmed Badawi, who was the head of the uh, Anshams University that day, and also was the director of the Center of Documentation, in order to inv investigate and check all these kind of uh, temples and how we can try to find a solution to, uh, to save it, not to be just uh, documented, because the center was founded, uh, as I said, in 1956, and the, we started immediately to, to do documentation, and the, mm, the, the pioneers of the, uh, who worked in the center of documentation at that time, they did a great job, and they document every little details about all the temples and the uh, troubles there, and really, it was a magnificent work done that those days we keep in our uh, center of documentation, all these records and the, the, the documentation, plans and the photos, and I will show you uh, later in this uh, lecture everything, what we have, as I said, the reports, and how we can use this in order to benefit all the scholars and the students to have a look and to, to get benefit. Uh, as I said, the, the countries we had after they the, the make this announcement and was connecting with uh, uh, the UNESCO was involved at that, uh, that time. And because the, the UNESCO at that time was uh, recently established and really when he involved with uh, the Egypt in protecting or salvage these temples, really it was for, for, for the, the UNESCO, it was the, the, the star because with this international campaign, the UNESCO became uh, very famous uh, all over the world. And we have 10 countries uh, involved in uh, this campaign. As you can see, Spain, Germany, Italy, United Kingdom, Belgium, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, France, United States of America, 
really they did a great job. They helped us. The, the, the duration of the campaign, it was uh, for 20 years. But for the Nubian temples, only eight years. Because they started in 1960, ends by the inauguration of the two temples of Abu Simbel in September 1968, which is eight, eight years to uh, uh, record and document and the uh, number all the blocks of all the temples and to be moved in a different place and to make an, a new environment to host those temples really was not an easy task at all. But with the, the help of these countries, we, we, they did a great job and we had the, to save these monuments for the humanity, for the mankind, because it's not only belonging to uh, Egypt, but belonging to the whole world. For that reason, this international campaign, really it was great to, to have this collaboration between countries in order to save this kind of uh, heritage and culture for all these, uh, the coming generations. What we, the center of documentation had, as I said, the, the components. We had scientific archive, documentation department, tombs and temples, Egyptian Antiquities Organization archive, and Babaira's uh, uh, archive. I'm not going to talk about all these elements or these components, just I will choose one or two, uh, two parts in order to highlight what we did and what we have and what we are doing for the colleagues all over the, uh, the world, because we have this kind of collaboration and the, we help a lot of scholars, uh, a lot of students to come to see what we have and the, we help them to give them images and uh, upon the, the, uh, the request. And really, there's something very important. The documentation department as the Nubian Salvage Company uh, campaign. You can see uh, the water is nearly next to the two temples of Abu Simbel, the, the great temple of uh, Ramses II, and his wife, Queen Fertari. The water, you can see during the work. This is the temple of Philae. It was completely covered. You can see the water covering, I think, half of the, uh, because the, 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 the bylon, it's about 20 meter high. And you can see the water when the flood, we have the flood, how it destroys or try to destroy the, the uh, inscription and everything. And the, the temple of, uh, the uh, temple of uh, Philae, it was the last temple was uh, saved and moved from its place to the new place in 1980. Because it was, as I said, to 20, 20 years. And because it was not an easy task to First of all, to isolate the temples from the water, how it function, and I will show you how we did, or the, 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 the countries or this campaign, try to, to protect or to prevent the water to reach the, the monuments with using the uh, iron beams. And you can see, uh, using uh, for, to, to, for uh, the temple of uh, uh, Philae, they used 3,000 iron beams in order to be around, surround all the, the temple in order to prevent the water and to put some sands and then to dry and then to start to numbering and to cut off all the, the temple into blocks and then to be uh, stored in somewhere and then to be moved to the new uh, island which is there and then according to the records and the numbers they try to did everything all together and they have the, the temple in its place, as you can see. The temple of Abu Simbel. This is an old photo, and you can see the water. This is when it was discovered, uh, 1813, at the beginning, but the first person who entered to the temple, it was 1817. You can see the water. This is the, the, the small temple of uh, Nefertari. You can see now the landscape of the temple of Abu Simbel and the water, it is just, you can see. And these all boats of the center of documentation, we did use this in order to have this. It has cabinets, 
in, for the uh, inspectors and to come every day starting to uh, document all the inscription and all everything inside the temple. This during the preparation of the moving and the cut and the recording and the cut all the temple into uh, plaques and this is the beams, as I said. The beams, and you can see, to prevent the water, you have to, this kind of uh, iron beams in order to prevent, and the, also the sand. Here, during the, the, the cut and uh, reassembling the, the blocks again. To have the, now uh, the temple of Abu Simbel, it is higher than its place, 64 meters of the original place. And they have to do uh, an artificial uh, mountain. Looks like the original one, using a concrete, a dome. It is done in a proper way in order to host all the temple because they move also, you can see behind. Here, this is the metal work and the concrete behind because they started to move first the, the Colossae of the Ramses, uh, the second, it is two, 20 meter high in the beginning, and you can see the, the cranes, and here also they are lifting the, the, the face and the, the, of, the, of the two statues. And it is the place for uh, restore, uh, uh, first to move and to give them the numbers and then to restore them, and then also to put this kind of mastabas in order to, to keep and to store, uh, store all the blocks. And this is the, the new location of the temple of Abu Simbel after it was moved. And this all artificial uh, mountain looked like the, the original one. After we finished, as a center of documentation, documenting all the, the temples and of, our, of Nubia, we moved north in order to document all, because the purpose in the beginning only to document all the temples supposed to be sunk in underwater. But after we had this task accomplished, we have to move to forward in order to do other documentation for all the monuments. We moved to Aswan and the Luxor, I'll show you quickly. This is a Nubian temple. You know, uh, regarding the, the international uh, service campaign for the Nubian uh, temples, uh, three, five object, five temples or temple and uh, uh, troubles uh, had been given away to some countries who helped Egypt uh, in doing this uh, international, really uh, great work in uh, salvage uh, the Nubian temples. Uh, first, the metropolitan, as I said, we give them the temple of Dandur. It's now there in, uh, in a, a nice place. And also the Abu Temple, it was in Madrid. Give it to Madrid and also we have the, the Gate of uh, Temple of Kalapsha in Berlin. We have also in Torino and also in Leiden. Only five countries had got uh, a gift from Egypt to them because they really did, they, they did a great job and they helped very much to preserve and to move all these monuments. This is the Kalapsha Island, has four temples. Kalapsha Temple. Garf Hussain, Bet El Wali, Kirtasi. As I said, this Fili. This is before and this is after the new island. This it for also we as I said, we moved north in order to complete the documentation of other temples, not only to stop 
for the Nubian temples, Komombu, Luxor Temple, Ramesium, the West Bank of Luxor, and also we did a lot of documentation for the tombs. We did document till now 470 tombs recorded and documented from the center of documentation till now. And also we moved, to, this is the Valley of the Queens, Valley of the Kings, also the Sibian tombs. Also, <coughs> not to record or to document this Documentation is not an easy task, and it's a very easy task, both. It is an easy task if you did document and then to, do, to have a database for all what you have documented, for others to check, others to come to get benefit from this. Because without a database, you don't know what you have. Only you have records, you have images, you have photos, you have plans, you have line drawings, but you need to, to have something real for people to, to, to use, people and uh, students, scholars, to use and to get benefit from what you have documented. Because without publishing such a, a database or uh, books or uh, newsletter of what you are doing, nobody will know what you are doing. You have to uh, have your, the information and knowledge available for everybody with different means. And that's what we, did, we are doing in the ministry and in the center of documentation in particular, to have our information and knowledge to present it to everybody who is different as a book, as a, as a, uh, as a database, and uh, our uh, center is open for everybody from any place to come to check what he wants really in, in, an, easy, in an easy way. We created something called the FAMUDIS. Uh, in order to, uh, to each image we have, it's, it has a new, unique number. There is no any repetition. It couldn't be because we have a primary number and then we have the final uh, number, but this before starting using the digital images, uh, digital cameras. In, we started to uh, digitize all the uh, tombs with digital cameras in 2005. Before this, all are black and white and normal uh, photos as you can uh, develop it in any uh, studio, but we have all our own lab to uh, develop our black and white uh, images, special lab with special uh, paper because we enlarge and small, because in order to also to use it for uh, line drawing, because in the old time, uh, before the 2005, we didn't use uh, the computer, only use the line drawing with my colleagues who do the line drawing with calc and so on and so, but now we're using the Photoshop and the Illustrator, you can uh, draw easily while you are staying at the office. And this is, uh, this is the old fish. We had, you can see, but this is the new one. After we make our database and they did all the entry, that the entry and the end, you can have this sheet with all the information better than this one. And we have also, you can find, you can, it is uh, uh, searchable. You can search for with anything you need. Any scene, it will come with the number of the photo and you can check in, the, in our place and you can have the photo with you. The Ramsium project. The Ramsium is a, a very important uh, temple in the West Bank of the Ramses II. The first, first pylon, it is demolished or not demolished, very destroyed. We don't know when exactly, maybe it was an earthquake in the ancient times. And then you can see here, there's the first pylon. It's 
it's quite, you, all these blocks need to be lifted and need to be numbered, need to be uh, stored in somewhere in order to re demolish the, the whole pile and then reassembling again with a, a, a different uh, environment. This is what we did a lot of restoration work in since 1991, we are working in the temple because the temple was reused also in the later time as for a burial and shafts and uh, for uh, late period uh, kitchen and the bakery, they was used in the late uh, period. And recently with the, the French uh, scenarists uh, from France, we and the MAFTO, we with the professor uh, Christian Leblanc, we are able to do some studies for this pylon. He did the numbering of all the blocks because this pylon has the Battle of Kaddish and we did all the numbering of the stones of the, of the pylon. It's supposed this is uh, an imagination how the pylon supposed to be to look like because the, the first pylon of the Luxor temple is quite similar because it's also Ramses II and this was supposed to have it if we uh, de uh, demolish and uh, renumbering and reassemble again it's supposed to be in the same shape of the same of the Luxor uh, temple recently we had uh, to sign uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Korean uh, north, uh, south of Korea in order to uh, have fund in order to work on this uh, pylon. And I think we're working at the moment in order to start working maybe next year in order to start to have the access, the access of the temple because the temple is not uh, the, the visit or the now it's not from the uh, uh, east uh, side of the temple from the pylon supposed to be, this is supposed to be the entrance, but now it's blocked because the fields, you can see the fields and the, uh, the, the, the entrance it is from uh, the, the, the north, not from the east, like the other uh, temples. And we are going to work next year, inshallah, to uh, start to work in this uh, pylon. As a center of documentation, recently we did, first we had this collaboration with the French since 1991 and working in the of the Ramsium. And the, till now we are working together. And we also recently, till since 2015, since I became the director of this place, we did a lot of cooperation with different uh, missions. As you can see, uh, we are working with Tbingen University, the Temple of Esna with the Brazilian universities in the tombs in 123 and 368, and also TT93, was also University of Corbinitensia, Madrid, the real cachet of the Deril Bahari, with the Cineris and Paris University of Laguna, La Laguna, in the, the tomb of Babaza, 279, and also the German Archaeological Institute in British Museum in the Glass Negative Archive, was also IFAO and the NEVIC, Ministry Administration Archive was also Institute of uh, Evaluationary uh, Medicine, University of Zurich, uh, the mummies and the human remains and the storerooms and the museums. I highlight the, uh, the four uh, in, in red because this I'm going to, to talk about them now, not to talk about all this uh, cooperation because the international cooperation with different universities is very important because not to, uh, we are not uh, for the antiquities or in Egypt because we have a lot and we cannot work it alone. We have to have some cooperation with different colleagues and different institutions who really wants to help and wants to, to really, they want to, 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 to help in preserving and the, this heritage. As I said in the beginning, this heritage is not only Egyptian heritage, it is the mankind heritage. Everybody has to give a hand in order to protect it, in order to preserve it to, for the uh, generation. Because uh, really, uh, based on nowadays of the changing of the climate, really the antiquities are suffering from different 
uh, kind of elements like uh, the underwater, like the high temperature, high humidity, really we are suffering. And for that reason, especially the organic uh, materials like the mummies and the, like the wood, we need a lot of help in, in order to preserve the, uh, such things like this. As I said, the Temple of Esna, really the Temple of Esna, uh, if you visited this temple 2000, we say 15, it now is quite uh, different because we, we, with the help of the Tibetan University, we were able to clean the dirt and all this kind of smoke, which was cover, covering the whole uh, inscription, the whole walls, and all, to see this kind of, look the colors, and you can see here, the middle, it's still without cleaning. We, we, we left this in order to see the differences between before and after and during. You can see the colors. And here as well, you can see that this all was covered. It was like black. And you can see here also as well. And here also the cartouches, two different cartouches, two different colors because of the. So, yes. as you can see. The scientific ar archive, what we have in our scientific archive have different materials, really very precious ones, especially the glass negatives, which uh, the date uh, go back to uh, 19th century, uh, made of uh, 18, 1850, 1870. We have these glass negatives in the early beginning of the photographing, they use these glass negatives in order to be, develop the images that to, to, to document. I will show different size of the, of the glass negatives. Also we have gelatine, we have plastic, we have different kind of films we need to be protected. And with the help of the German Archaeological Institute and the British Museum, we did a great project together in order to protect and to change the environment of uh, restoring these, uh, these uh, materials to, to, to have a free asset-free uh, paper, asset-free uh, parks in order to, be, to preserve these uh, materials. As you can see also, uh, the differences between here, the old environment, and this is the new, and all, uh, all the, uh, this old envi environment of the storing these uh, glass negatives. As I said, we have different size. Gelatine, this is very, very, really, uh, uh, very important to protect those uh, gelatine uh, images. Old photos, blast crawls, prints. You can see the image of the, the Sphinx when it was completely covered with sand and debris. And what you can see also. With, uh, as I said, with the help of the uh, German Archaeological Institute and the, before it, it was the British Museum in London, they provide us with all the new high-tech cameras, scanners, and also the acid-free papers and the box in order to protect and to do some documentation to take photos of the, uh, of the glass negative and then to restore them in the, such a new uh, storage, a new box with a label with uh, the acid-free envelopes. And this, as I said, this is the old environment, how it looked like using this wooden, wooden box. And you can see here, this is old and this is the new. Each box of, uh, from this uh, collection has its own, the, uh, the contents. Each box has its, the numbers and the contents and the, also in the computer we had uh, this uh, database, especially for this uh, archive. And also, uh, we have to work also parallel 
do documentation and also do restoration and preserve this kind of glass negatives. You cannot make the glass negative if it's broken. You cannot attach them and there is no glue to, to attach them and make it. But we used a new, not a new, there's a technique used for preserving such things like this. Our colleague, uh, Ibrahim, from the Grand Egyptian Museum, he really is an, an, an expert in working in this kind of uh, material. And he, you can see he had uh, uh, to have this kind of protection and the frame in order to protect the broken uh, glass negatives. This also storage environment, the old one, and the new one. Also, as I said, we have the photograph database. Each image we have to know if it's possible to have who is the photographer and uh, which date go back. And you have to fill in all the, the fields in the database. And it's very, very important to have such an, uh, a database for this archive. And also, one of the greatest uh, uh, archive we have, it is something the administration of the minister, not the minister of the uh, antiquity organization, back to 1870, 1880. And this correspondence, really very important to tell you a lot of things, especially what I'm going to show you right now. It is something very unique and very important to show, to create uh, establish and to establish the uh, School of Egyptology. It was 18, 1881 and starting to function at 1882. And this is the memo for uh, establishing the, uh, this uh, school of Egyptology. And it, uh, as you know, uh, uh, the antiquities was under the direction of the French when they started uh, during the, uh, the time of uh, Muhammad Ali Basha, the ruler of Egypt in, in 1850 or 1840. And uh, when, when he gave Rifa'at Tahtawi to supervise all these things, and then the French and the foreigners are taking care of all the monuments at that time. This was the first uh, memo to establish this kind of uh, school, and the cost for four years, it was 500 Egyptian pounds that time, in 1881. Also, one of the very interesting uh, book or notebook we found, it was the, this book, it is the minute of meetings of the Berman Committee. Go back to 1898 till, 19, till 1900, and you can see how they managed to write everything, all the details. You can see the date. I'm right. Yes, 1898. This is very interesting document we have. This, uh, before the law of antiquities, which is, was uh, 18, uh, 1983, the law called 117. Before, when you are going to dig in Egypt, you can have a portion or 50-50. If you found, for example, 100 pieces, it could be divided. You will have 50 and you can take it with you anywhere and leave other 50 in the country. This is one of the uh, important uh, documents we have is between the Egypt Exploration Society or uh, in London with antiquity. And it, it was in Tal Amarna 1924. It was February 1924. You can see the date here. And this is the division system was there at that time. Be, be, uh, according to the law, now it is prevented. It's not anymore, uh, made of last uh, 17s, 70s of last century, it was prevented, it was canceled to make a division. And uh, we, have, we are very lucky, very lucky that all the treasures of Tutankhamun remained in Egypt, even it was 1922, when they discovered 
this uh, uh, treasure and this uh, by Howard Carter, and it was a lot of fight that time. How they want to have all the I I I I, I still remember uh, I, when I read the letter addressed from Lord Carnarvon to Sir Alan Gardner, who studied Egyptology. You know who is Sir Alan Gardner? Telling him after he entered the uh, the antechamber of the King Tut, it was 28th of November, 1922, when he said a one sentence that the second floor of the British Museum will host all these kind of treasures. And alhamdulillah that it is now discovering the second floor of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And now it will be, it's moved 80% uh, of the old artifacts now moved to the Grand Egyptian Museum, which will be inaugurated very soon. And uh, everybody will be welcome to visit the, the treasures or this 5,398 5, uh, pieces of the treasures of the King Tut. It will be displayed all together in the Grand Egyptian Museum. And uh, thanks to the uh, Pierre Lacou, at that time, was in charge of the antiquities. And he, fought, he, he really he did, uh, he did a great job in to prevent uh, this uh, uh, disaster, uh, to move all the artifacts to outside the country with Moros Basha Hanna, at that time, who also both altogether they, they did a great job to prevent the transporting all the artifacts to uh, England and to be transported to Cairo to be uh, displayed in the Egyptian Museum uh, in Tahrir. This is the process of uh, scanning the documents, our colleagues in the, in the Center of Documentation. With the help of the IFAO, the French Institute for Archaeology in Egypt, and the Danevic uh, and the Netherlands uh, and the Flemish Institute in Cairo, we did uh, document all this archive and they also convert to have a new environment with asset free to protect this, this uh, archive. We come now to something very important. Recently, since 2005, when we have this revolution to have the high tech technique dealing with mummies. And uh, with the Institute of uh, Evaluation Medicine, University of Zurich, the mummies and the human remains, the stores, the store rooms and the uh, museums, we had a very close collaboration with Frank Rulli as a representative of Zurich uh, University to, to do a lot of great cooperation work in the mummies and how to understand the, because if you look at the mummy, at the mummy, you cannot, you don't know why it was died or the disease or so and so. But with the help of the, uh, the, the scientists and the science in that time, we are able to recover and reveal a lot of secrets of diseases and also of the mummification and the embalming issues. This trailer has the cat the CAT scan machine. That is the only place all over the, the world is unspecialized in medicine and medical affairs to have such a CAT scan machine. It was the Ministry of Antiquities or the Supreme Council of Antiquities. In 2005, National Geographic was a collaboration with Siemens Company in Germany. They donated this uh, later with this CAT scan machine in order to do the research for the mummy of the King Tut, Ankamon, and the other royal mummies. Because as I said, the, we, Dr. Zaha was created uh, the Egyptian uh, mummy project. And the, with this project, we are be able to do a lot of research, lo a lot of cooperation uh, with different institutions, especially with Frank and his institution to do a lot of research in this uh, uh, project. This it was in the Egyptian Museum and it's still there. 
and you can see uh, the CAT scan. And as I said, as, uh, as a, uh, an institution, the antiquity institution, the first time all over the, the world that an institution like Saint, uh, Supreme Council of Antiquities had such uh, a machine. And this, this image go back to 2005, and you can see Frank and myself, where I was responsible, I was the director of this project, and Dr. Zai was the head of the team, and we did a great, a great, uh, really a great uh, job, and uh, when we did the scans of the King Tut, it was in the Valley of the Kings in March 2005, and uh, something happened really very strange, and the people saw that it is the curse of the Tutankhamun, because for the first time to have this storm, to have rains in the Valley of the Kings in, in March, and also the machine stopped, really. When we left the mummy from uh, the sarcophagi, from the burial chamber to the machine, immediately for half an hour, the machine was stopped. You, you know this better than me, and I was there, of course, but really we, said that it is the curse, and we're not going to succeed. We're not going to continue. We have to close everything and to go back home without doing anything. And after half an hour, the machine uh, restarted again, and we did these uh, uh, scans till it was five or six o'clock in the, in the evening, and we finished by 11. Uh, a clock, and then we re returned back that the mummy to its place, and do everybody went home, and everybody really it was an experience uh, that night. We will never forget these uh, memories at all. The celebrating hundred year of the discovery of the tomb of King Tut Anka Moon, it was a great uh, success to have such uh, a conference with a cooperation with the American Research Center in Egypt. To, to host and to, to organize two days conference in Luxor. And of course, because all the team who involved in the King Tut research was invited and Frank was one of them. And he really, he, he presented a great uh, uh, paper talking about why we scan the King Tut, what is important to scan the, the mummy of the King Tut really went uh, back to the scientists. And the science, really, it was very important to have scanned this mummy because we knew, and they can say, regard, uh, according to the images of the CAT scan, and also for the DNA uh, tests, you can now know that, that what happened to the, to, to, to the king when he died, what the purpose when he died, because a lot of rumors, a lot of uh, speculation saying was died, uh, maybe it was murdered, or maybe he had a, a malaria, maybe he was, but with really this technique and this, with the science, we are able to know his family with the, using the DNA tests and also to know roughly why he was died because he was, the, 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 what they, they said that was training, he was, uh, in his chariot, and he was fall down, and his left knee was broken, and he's injured, and because of the blood and the malaria, he died very quickly. And then he was he, he died when he was 19, and he was ruling Egypt when he was 10, and the only uh, 10 uh, 10 years uh, as a ruler of Egypt. But to are very lucky to have his tomb intact, uh, and with all these golden treasures. As I said, uh, we did really uh, cooperation. Also, one of the great uh, opportunities for us as a uh, Supreme Council of Antiquities, we do a memorandum of understanding with uh, the institute here to uh, document and to study the human remains and the mummies. We did uh, three different uh, workshops. One, two workshop in person. One, it was in Bahareya Oasis with different uh, colleagues for the magazine. And they did, uh, they got learned how to deal with the mummies and the human remains according to the manual uh, Frank did 
uh, and presented to my colleagues in the uh, ministry. Really, uh, we are able now to have, uh, we'll try to have a, 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 an, a team uh, get learned how to deal with the mummies and the human remains according to the sheet, according to the database it will be created for this purpose. This memorandum of understanding was signed to 2020. This is in Bahareya Oasis, and also we did one uh, workshop in Saqqara, uh, an inspectorate, was also our inspectors there, and they also different issues, different uh, elements of uh, workshop, especially, but the focus it was really, because we need such a workshop, we need such a, uh, a technique to how to deal with uh, the mummy and how you document uh, the, the human remains. And really, because also Mahmoud is creating a, a database regarding this issue, and that it will be, inshallah, functioning very, in the uh, very near future. And it is manual that Frank and his team did for the inspectors in order to use it while they are dealing with the mummies and with the human remains. And also we did really one of the successful uh, lecture online uh, attended by almost 200 persons in one hour and a half. Really it was uh, hosted by Frank and really, and organized by Mahmoud and myself. Really we, we, we did uh, all the participants get learned and get uh, a lot of experience as a start for those people who are working in the magazines. And the magazines, well, as I said, we have three, uh, 34 magazines all over the country full of thousands of fragments, thousands of human remains, and the mummies altogether need to be looked after. And how we can look after those mummies and the human remains without uh, training, without learning how to deal and how to document how to classify the booze itself. And really, this is very important, uh, this kind of uh, cooperation uh, with Frank and the, the Institute, because really this is the demand now in the ministry to have such, uh, to create such a lab and such a system dealing with uh, the, uh, the mummies and the human remains. Really, we are very lucky to have uh, Frank as our uh, partner in this regard, because uh, now it is really essential demand in, in the ministry to create such a lab with uh, people who are already keen to learn, keen to work, keen to be specialized uh, in this kind of, of field of the antiquities, because we have a lot of inspectors, but very rare who at join this kind of training or this kind of uh, field. Really, the, now we have only few people who work in that uh, field, but we, with the cooperation with Frank, we'll make extension and we'll, we'll have people to join these uh, workshops and this lab very soon, maybe in the very, very near future. Also, uh, one of the great things we did, this uh, give the others uh, the certificate of the attendees and the, their, uh, their work, and really it was a great uh, opportunity for, for me as center of documentation and to also to uh, represent the Minister of the Supreme Council of Antiquities to work closely in this field because as a head of documentation, part of my job is to document the mummies and the human remains without uh, because it will be neglected, it will be uh, if nobody know how to deal with even the mummy, how he can lift the mummy from its place to move it to another place or to put it on the shelf, really this kind of, of technique, it will be uh, used and it will be learned from the cooperation with Frank and the and Institute. And really I would like to thank you all for coming and for attending the, the lecture and uh, I'm ready if there is any question I can answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hisham, for this great overview. And I think you already stressed the importance of collaboration and it's on both sides. You know, we, 
really learn a lot about the knowledge of, of your local people who are experienced dealing with mummies for millions of uh, millenniums of years. So um, basically this is something which we really appreciate and I think as you already stressed it's, it's important to collaborate from various angles. It's not only the medically qualified people who work on these kind of issues but you can have other people at, uh, like Egyptologists, um, um, molecular biologists, you name it, um, who work together. So this is really something uh, most important. Are there any questions, comments? It's kind of a comment in the question. Oh, maybe I can, I can give you this yes. microphone, actually. Oh, I can just speak loudly. <laughs> <laughs> and then she has one after me, so I'll just hand it to her. Okay, so, f wow, that's loud. Okay, so first of all, thank you for that. It was really interesting. Um, it was really cool to see how you guys have solved so many issues, like the monuments with the dam, you were able to move them, which is just incredible. Um, but then the documents, you know, you, could, you scan them, the photos are now archived. Then looking at the mummies, you know, you made partners to, to see T-scan. Um, so I would just say, the question is, what do you think is going to be like the next challenge that you guys tackle? What's like the next thing on your list of things to better document or, yeah, just what's the, what's the next step? I think that the challenge we are facing at the moment, as I said, the organic materials in the, in the storerooms. The storerooms is not really, it's not the, the, the right environment because we cannot have this bubble as you know, to, uh, to restore, uh, store all these mummies because it needs a special uh, treatment, special uh, environment in order to preserve and uh, to keep them uh, away of any bacteria, of any, because as you know, it is very fragile and also it is uh, organic. It could be if they have a high temperature, it could also be damaged or destroyed. For that reason, this kind of documentation with the people who are Expert, uh, they are experts in this. Like Frank and his team, really, what he did in the uh, three uh, workshops, people became really keen to learn how to deal with them these materials. And for me, as uh, the director or the under secretary, said for the documentation, this is the essential uh, demand for me in order to document all these human remains and the mummies. It is neglected since long time. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk as well. I'm delighted to see that uh, there's some like effort put into the documentation, which is very, very uh, vital part, and especially like also the databases that you're collecting because it's very, very important for for everybody in the world to also get the information out there. Um, so my question is more like. Um, Concerning the geography, I guess, like um, I was intrigued by the pictures that you showed about those temples that were um, as a as an entirety like moved from place to place. Um, so, how do you think? Is there like documentation or something like information of how those places have looked throughout the history? Has have these floods like always? been like uh, basically flushing these uh, these sites or has something happened in the late decades or centuries to to form the the geography so that the they are like basically the the floods are now more uh higher and and more i guess like you know threatening to those sites that you have to do this like very tremendous moves uh for the floods, because as I said, when we had the, the first dam, uh, it was erected and integrated in 1902, it was not enough to prevent the, the flood and the water to cover the, most of the country for six months uh, yearly. But by erecting the new high dam, it was, we are able to prevent the water, to the flood, to reach the, the country or to destroy the fields or the houses or the monuments. With this campaign, when, as I said, it was really a, a great job when they decided to, to move it and to, to another place away of the water, away of the reach of the, the floods if there is, but alhamdulillah there is no floods at the, uh, there at all. And also to use the high dam for double benefits 
to prevent the water and to also the electricity. It, is very, it was essential demand in that time for the country, and I think the electricity all over, all over the world, it's very essential demand because without electricity, without energy, you cannot do anything. But was it like that always? Like was it that f f like that for hundreds of years that every year there was like floods that would come all the way to these monuments, like over since since they were built, basically? Yes, yes, I think so. And, wow. Uh, but uh, okay. we, uh, recently, and I think uh, uh, th this moment w w remained because in the beginning it was the flood is not because also the ancient Egypt tried to avoid the floods or the, avoid the water to reach their uh, monuments because this is for <laughs> yeah, eternal, this is supposed to be for the afterlife. This build this kind of tombs and the temples for the afterlife in order to, to for the cult, for the religion, for some purposes. But uh, also they, they considered the water, they considered the floods for that reason. But when, the, 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 as I said, the climate changed and the, 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 the rains from the thaws from the for for the Nile, all uh, affect mm -hmm. the, the the monuments, and then we have to to prevent the water, prevent the destroying of the fields and the antiquities in the same time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I actually had the same question here yeah, about like how much <laughs> has been destroyed. Like, how much do we think we've lost in the last thousand years? Like, how many? How much flooding has there been? How many tombs? Have you kind of found that you think the floods have got into and destroyed all of the organic remains? Or we cannot count it because we don't know. We don't yet discover all the monuments to say. And the, uh, I, I, I did work in the two tombs recently. We discovered and we did clear all the debris. We found tafla. It is of the flood, and uh, you cannot say anything because you have to. It is uh, uh, you have to to study the case by case, not all, because there is tombs without no flood at all, because it was in the mountain, up in the mountain. But the, 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 if it is the bottom of the mountain, it is near by the, the, the ground, it could be affected by the flood and the water and everything. Hmm. But we lost a lot of the living areas, because the living areas is basically in the, yes. in the area where the Nile uh, was falling. Yeah. And it was made out of bricks and not of stone. Yeah. So that's basically disappeared. Mm. But for the monuments of the uh, Nubia, we don't lost anything. We mm. moved all the monuments there. Only a chapel of the Garf Hussein Temple is still there under the under the water. But we did have uh, all the documents, and we published the recent, the final book of the Garf Hussein, the fifth volume, and it has all the drawings and all the images, which the, 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 the trouble is under the water at the moment. Hmm. It gives you an idea of like the scale of the problem of climate change and what we're going to have to do to deal with rising water levels. It's just, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, hope, that, yeah, I hope that you can save the, the magnificent um, stuff that you've got. Uh, I also love the picture of you and Frank uh, in 2005 <laughs> with Tutankhamun. That's very, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very similar, yeah. Yes, yes, Was it yes. that long ago? Unbelievable, guys. Um, no, just very impressive that you were involved in that work as well, so thank you. You know, as a school kid, I'm sure all of us grew up hearing about how Tut died, and I didn't realize, yeah, that's very impressive, so thank you. Thank you. Any more comments, questions? Thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, my question is about uh, the human remains. So um, you showed this online archive uh, with everything, all the temples and stuff. What about the human remains? So do you have uh, different kind of um, lists where all the human remains, skeletal remains are listed? So let's say uh, different sites and are they divided by chronology? So um, do you have some uh, detailed uh, database or not, or not yet? Uh, frankly, I'm saying to have a list, no. I have to say, because it's thousands of uh, human remains and mummies. But I'm, I know where it is stored, because the, the storage is under my supervision. I know the 34 magazine had a lot of uh, human remains and the mummies need to be documented for that reason we have this close uh, cooperation because with this uh, collaboration the memorandum of understanding will be able to do the documentation and do you know the number what we have because you I cannot say we well, have hundred or thousand or ten thousand no 
If I said this, I'm, I'm lying. Mm -hmm. But because nobody knows how many human remains or mummies mm -hmm. in uh, the magazines. Because every day we discover a lot. In, in, the, in, the, uh, in the excavation I did, the two tombs go back to the 18th dynasty. We found a lot of human remains. A lot of human remains. Skulls, mummies, part of chests, legs, hands, a lot. And I cannot account them because it's not yet studied, not yet uh, classified. I have a colleague of mine doing uh, some preliminary report about the funds. But to say I have thousand? No. There's a lot of work to do then. Yes. That sounds promising. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said at the beginning, that's, that's the beginning of science, you know, without knowing what yes. you have, you can't plan science. <clears throat> You know, one of the aspects where uh, high-resolution photographic documentation and uh, availability of this documentation has been a game-changer has to do with papyrology. This is my field of studies. And this not only allows us to work from every corner on the, of the world on the documents, but preserves the documents themselves. So I was wondering how your work looks like in this direction. Uh, really... Uh, this is a matter, this is a really a problem we're facing because the papyri is organic and without special treatment and preservation, you will lose a lot of information. And I think my colleague Mahmoud works in such things like this and really it is a hard task. But my colleagues in the Egyptian Museum, they are working very hard. We have a special uh, lab in the Egyptian Museum dealing with all the papyri, but this is only the Egyptian Museum or the Grand Egyptian Museum or the Civilization Museum. But the other uh, magazines who have hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, papyri also we create. We have a, a special department in my, under my supervision working in this, try to do a lot of uh, documentary, a lot of digiting, digitizing uh, images in order to put together, all together in the uh, in the database and to be available. And also, once we are documenting those babairai, we have to recommend the restoration, the preservation, because without preservation or restoration, you will, lost, you will lose a lot of information. And it really, it is not, it is very hard uh, task. Uh, final question. Or? You were talking about the Ramisium First Pylon project. Uh, and if I understand you right, uh, you told that it's still ongoing. So what is... We're not yet started yet. Uh, okay. We already signed a memorandum of understanding with the Heritage uh, Foundation in, uh, North, uh, in Korea in order to fund, because it will cost a lot of millions. Because first of all, you have to buy the land in front of the pylon. In order to build up mastabas, special uh, ones to have to host all these blocks, blocks very, very heavy, one or two, three tons, or maybe more, and to, to classify them, to give them numbers. Because what we give, the numbers from inside the temple, but the blocks need to be lifted, need to be numbered, and they give them uh, the, the numbers and then put them in the, in the mastabas and then demolish the whole uh, pylon and to make the base concrete or whatever and it is really it is not an easy task because we are still this since long time we are trying to, to find a solution but we, maybe with the help of the Korean we can able to to dem dismelting the, the, the pylon and rebuild it again so the goal is really to re-erect the front of, of the to, pylon to, because yeah. I, I, I have seen mm -hmm. the, the blocks from the, 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 the eastern side, uh, side is collapsed all up the others. But from inside, because it's very, very, very wide, and it's supposed to be stairs inside the pylon, like the, the Madinit Habu uh, and the Ramsium and the, our Karnak, all the pylon has to have some stairs to, in order to go up and so. This is uh, really, we're facing a, a problem, not a problem, but inshallah, it will be solved and we we'll start in maybe next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. That was fascinating. And there uh, you see so many questions. Thanks again for this visit. That was marvelous. Thank you so much. Thank you.